to the Rustic Historical and Art Museum of Holton, founded by Ransford Shaw in 1937. Mr. Shaw, or excuse me, Squire Shaw, I should say, a, a prominent Holton attorney and former Maine Attorney General, founded the museum in 1937 in one room on the second floor of the Nickerson block downtown. Very quickly they ran out of space and uh, fortunately what we call the White Building at 109 Main Street, then the McIntyre House came up for sale and through the generosity of Sim and Stella King White, uh, the Whites purchased the building for the town to be used as a museum and also for office space and it continues to be used as the home of our museum and the Greater Holton Chamber of Commerce to this day. In this corner we have artifacts from the Holton Air Base 1941 to 19, very early 1944 and then from July of 44 into about May of 1946, it served as Camp Holton German Prisoner of War Base, German, German Prisoner of War Camp. Now, <clears throat> we know that there were about 3,500 German prisoners of war in total uh, that passed through the Holton Camp at one time or another, and that the Holton Camp was the lead camp, the headquarters camp, for five other camps, four of which were in Maine and one in New Hampshire. This is an oil portrait of Holton's founder, Joseph Holton. Uh, we know that it actually was redone from a much, much older oil portrait in 1957. A couple of Joseph Holton's great-grandsons contributed $5,000 to the remodeling and upgrading of the Aroostook Hospital and they also provided this portrait of Joseph Holton to hang in the hospital and it was subsequently donated to the museum which we're very proud to have. Down below in the center you can see the picture of Joseph Holton and his lovely wife, Sarah Putnam, and they um, are credited with being the founders of Holton, but in actuality, Sarah's mother, who is uh, off to just to the left, is really the founder, the grandmother, if you will, of Holton, because she was the one who insisted that all of her children and their families and her sister Eunice Trask Putnam's families come up to this New Salem Academy grant in the far northern uh, portions of what was then Massachusetts and they were a hundred miles north of the nearest main settlement down in Old Town and 100 miles south of the Acadian settlement up in the Madawaska Territory. So it was really quite a bold move on um, Lydia Trask Putnam's part. Lydia was 87 years old and returning on horseback in an April snowstorm from Woodstock when she took sick and she made it only as far as Joseph and Sarah's house which was right at the top of Holton Hill that we now call Drake's Hill where the road goes into the old Hancock Barracks, Garrison Road. And a couple of days later she died but it's hard to imagine uh, a woman of 87 years old on horseback in an April snowstorm. She was one tough old gal, so we are proud to call her the grandmother. Now, of we are known as the Aroostook County Historical and Art Museum, primarily because Stella King White, in addition to writing the history of caribou and obviously having a keen interest in history, 
She also was quite an accomplished artist, so we also do have a number of paintings and other uh, works of art within our museum. And this is probably our best painting. This painting was done by a German prisoner who escaped. He went to New York, did a lot of painting in around Central Park, not only of what he saw in New York, but also what he remembered from his native Austria. Uh, this particular painting is of Austria, and it was painted at Camp Holton and given to the commander of Camp Holton after he had been recaptured and was sent to the most secure camp. Of course, he escaped from the camp in New Hampshire because he never would have escaped from Camp Holton. Pictured here is Shepherd Carey, Aroostook County's first millionaire. And I say that with full confidence. Shep didn't start out that wealthy by a long shot. Uh, Shep, when he first came to the New Salem Academy grant, then Holton Plantation, in 1823, couldn't find work here and actually went into New Brunswick where he worked as a carpenter for about three years. Around 1826, he came back to Holton. He started up a little store, and lo and behold, here comes the United States Army in 1828, and Shep Carey was in the right place at the right time, and he took full advantage of it. There was nothing like a big government contract, and he became a sutler for Hancock Barracks. He had huge operations in the great North Main Woods. Uh, he owned a couple of townships of land on the Allagash River. He cut one piece of pine on the Allagash uh, in the mid-1840s that measured six feet by six feet on the small end of a 40-foot stick. It was reported that that one uh, stick of wood sold at St. John for $500 in the next spring and if so, we know that to have been the wages for the entire winter for approximately a half a dozen men. So there was big money to be made in those big, tall, virgin pine trees. In the good years, they did very well. In the bad years, they didn't. But Shep had an answer to that too, which wouldn't right, quite jive with our labor laws of today. Nobody got paid until after the sticks were sold. So you got your share depending on how good a year it was and a major problem was men would fight with each other in the camp and some would leave. Well if you left Shep Carey's camp and you'd worked half the winter you received absolutely nothing for pay. So, ah yes. Not every piece in a museum necessarily has to have great historical or even artistic significance. We have this alder bush, which was cut by Harry M. Briggs. And Harry says that this proves there are other crooked things on earth beside lawyers. And our apology to our founder, Ransford Shaw, for that comment, but you've got to have a sense of humor. We have a number of artifacts in this corner to the Aroostook County Potato Empire. E.L. Cleveland was the the biggest dealer of them all, and potatoes, 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 made Aroostook County. On the top shelf of this cabinet, we have Indian clubs and Indian clubs. Now the set of Indian clubs on the left were actually used as a martial arts tool, and they, were even an Olympic event at the start of the 1900s. Indian clubs? Yes, they are. These Indian clubs, however, are a little more significant. Our earliest Native Americans in this area would cut down small trees, pull them up by the root, and would sharpen those roots, and they were a very common weapon of warfare. They were also used in ritualistic dance. 
after the railroads had come through, uh, particularly by the 1890s down to Indian Island and Old Town, the Penobscots discovered that these were a lot easier to make than baskets and they sold like hotcakes to all of those tourists coming through. So uh, we believe the first two probably were made for the tourist trade. The one back in behind, we have high hopes that that just might be the real McCoy and it might be significantly older. Uh, hopefully at some day we'll have someone come through or someone who sees this video who can tell us more about it. We sure would love to know. We have a lot of other artifacts in this case which uh, many of them actually were made in the southwest by tribes out in that region. Uh, Holton people would travel by railroad, they would bring things home, and then their kids, when they were going through their things after they'd passed, would pass them along to the museum, which we appreciate. This is a photograph of Wording Hall, which was built in 1886-1887 for Holton Academy. It was built as the result of a very generous $30,000 gift by Mrs. Catherine Wording in, remem in remembrance of her late husband. And it was as fine a school as you would find anywhere in the state of Maine. There was an auditorium, for example, that sat 500 people on the, the second floor of this building. And I know of one story that's passed down in my family when General John Cummings' son took his family from Ludlow out to Minnesota. They left their daughter Elby behind so that she could finish her quality education at Holton Academy that she could not get in the wilds of Minneapolis in the late 1860s. So, school had a great reputation. Uh, Unfortunately, this building burned in 1944, and in 1946 it was replaced by the Wording Hall in the lower pictures. When the school went bankrupt in 1978, this building actually was doubled in size and is now Ricker Plaza. Underneath that we have a picture of C. Arthur Smith who taught English at Ricker, and his daughter Samantha, who wrote a letter to Russian President Yuri Andropov in the early 80s, asking him why the Russians and the Americans weren't getting along, uh, the danger of nuclear war. <coughs> Andropov responded to the little girl and invited her over to Russia and she basically was used by both the US and Russia as kind of a friendly neutral point that people could focus on and um, get past some of the hostility of the Cold War. Unfortunately uh, when she was 15 years old she and her father were killed in a plane crash and as a result of the experience that she had had with the Russians, the Russians actually dedicated a postage stamp to Samantha, which we see up in the far corner here of the Ricker Room. Uh, the photo on the left is an enlargement of the Russian postage stamp and to the right of it the sheet of stamps uh, is an actual sheet of the Russian postage stamps. There were at least two attempts that I know of to convince the US Postal Service to issue a stamp in this young lady's honor and unfortunately both attempts failed. 